So as I mentioned, this is a discussion of how I see the system is for getting a faculty position in science and how to succeed in it. This is not meant to be a idea of how the system should work. Rather, I think this is my opinion on how the system does work. And I think it's quite important for everyone who's trying to get into the system to have really an honest idea of how the system is working. And if you don't like that, fantastic, get a position and then start changing it. If anything here rings true to you, drop me a tweet. If it, you don't like it, you disagree, drop me a tweet. Or if you want to have a private discussion, drop me an email. Okay, so first of all, if you're going to get a position, you're going to have to build your application. And if you're applying for a research position at a university or a research institute, essentially the job committee wants someone who can do exciting science. And that means three things. You've got to be able to come up with ideas. You've got to be able to raise the funding for those ideas. And you've got to be able to actually execute those ideas. And so they're trying to look for someone whose CV says that they can do those three things. If you're coming up with ideas, you've got to really be able to have research plans that are exciting. No one wants to fund incremental work up front. Now, we all end up doing incremental work because not every idea ends up being as exciting as we think, but you at least need to start out with some ideas that are exciting. They need to be novel. You need to show me why it's novel. You need to show me why it's important and what difference it would make if it works. So think big. Try to not just think of the next experiment or even the next paper, but really what are you going to do over five to 10 years that would make a difference? And in particular, why are you the person to do this? I think that's really a point that we'll come back to in the CV section. Now, in terms of raising the funding, you have to show that you've got a record of raising funding. The easiest way to do this is a record of prizes and fellowships. And the time to start building that is really right now. Start building that record in your PhD. Start building that record in your postdoc. There are actually a lot of places to get small pots of money. A lot of travel grants end up having success rates that are close to 100% because postdocs don't apply. Maybe you've got funding from someone in your lab. Maybe the, the cost is so low you don't, fund, you don't apply. Maybe you don't even know that it exists and you don't apply but look for those opportunities because there are a lot of opportunities for travel grants and it means you can put a small grant on your CV. Poster prizes are great. Um, company awards for free reagents. Often there'll be an email going out saying, um, send us a small description and we'll give you $2,000 worth of reagents for it. It's basically a marketing ploy by those companies, but it lets you put on your CV a small little reagent um, grant. Because essentially, you need to have a CV that supports grants, and people do not want to fund, give money to people that, unless other people have also given them money. And it's extremely circular thinking that to get money, you have to show that other people want to give you money. And the way you break into that circular cycle is to start that record of small prizes, small fellowships, and then build up as you can go. Now, in terms of proving that you can execute the ideas that you're proposing, here, I tend to think that past performance is one of the best indicators of future success. And here, that means that first author research publications are really the currency of your faculty application. If you have done good science, you're proving it with first author research publications, that shows that you can do good science again. I would say that co-first authorship is generally considered equal. I've never judge someone less because they were co-first. Um, I would just use an asterisk though. Some people flip the order on papers or on their CV and that doesn't strike me quite right because you know I'll then do a quick search on PubMed and, and suddenly the author order is different and it just um, for me it doesn't feel right. So how many papers do you need to have a serious application for a junior position? Here I would say two to four first author research articles of substance is generally the standard that people are looking at to give you a junior faculty position at the tenure track. I have seen people get in with one really top level first author um, article. I've also seen people that get in with 10 articles that are less substantial. Um, but two to four, 
articles of substance that a first author is a pretty good guide. Now the question of course then is what does of substance mean? And here the nice thing is that it's up to you to make the case. You get to frame the case in the way that advantages you. So do you publish in high impact factor journals? Well then fantastic, drop the names of the journals, drop, drop the impact factors. Do you have instead high citations? Maybe you're not publishing in Nature Immunology, but you're publishing in JI and your papers are getting as many citations as a Nature Immunology paper. So instead, focus on citations. Maybe you've made novel techniques that are being picked up by lots of other groups. Great, that should be the focus. If you're covered by news and views or you've led to patents, you, know, you can emphasize that. The thing is, your articles have to be of substance, but you get to pick the context that you're displaying those articles. So you get to pick the way to show that they're of substance. But if you can't show they're of, of substance, then you're in trouble. The other thing I'd say is that success in multiple locations is very good evidence that you're the winning ingredient. I do like it when I see an application that has got two really top papers, one from their PhD and one from their postdoc or maybe one from their first postdoc, one from their second postdoc. That to me says this person can succeed rather than that lab was successful. So let's move on to the CV, how you're actually going to write your application. Here, I'd say a generic CV is not a good CV. If you can use the same CV for 10 different jobs, expect to get no replies. A really good CV should be selling a narrative that is absolutely aligned with the position that you're applying for. And every position is slightly different. So if you're not spending time on that CV and that narrative, you're going to end up having um, bad luck at your, at your applications. Now your narrative needs to be consistent with the position, but it also needs to be consistent with the project that you're selling. Um, and so here I'd say that the narrative should indicate deliberate trajectory. It's very common to say, I went here and did my masters, I went here and did my PhD, I went here and did my postdoc. Fine, that's all good, but don't just tell me where you went, tell me why you went there. I wanna see that there is a, a reason why you have made those transitions. And, I, and it, sometimes we do things not because we're going through a completely rational career oriented approach. Maybe you went there because um, you know, your partner was interested in working in your city. That's fine, but don't put that in your CV. Instead, you have to create a story that is plausible and you can sell that story in your CV. And the way to do this is think, my aim was always to apply for the current position. Now, how do I rewrite my history so that it looks like I always wanted to apply for this position and I always wanted to do this project? So you rewrite that history specifically for this application. One of the good tricks is to triangulate. Let's say that you want to do some neuroimmunology experiments. You can say that was always my plan. That's why I did neuro for my PhD. I did immuno for my postdoc. And it looks very deliberate rather than, you know, you did neuro for your PhD because that was a lab that you just found interesting. And then you changed topics because you found another lab interesting or the place you went to didn't happen to have a good neuro lab. You know, in reality, we're all a leaf carried by the river of life, but don't, don't make that um, the vision of your CV. Make everything look deliberate. And um, it helps also to distinguish you from your past PIs, because if you're saying that you're taking skills from two different labs, that means that you're the person who can do this. It's not just that your old lab could do it. The other thing in your CV, you gotta highlight your success. And remember that your CV template can be modified. You'll see a CV template that you download and you're going to put in different, um, different sections, but you can modify the whole template of your CV. So if you've got a major weakness, don't, don't make it an undeveloped section. Don't have a section saying prizes, none. Yeah. Um, maybe you'll have a section saying prizes and talks and because you've done, given lots of talks. So you can merge those sections in a way that hides the fact that you've got a weakness and we've all got weaknesses. And if you've got a major strength that is not part of a generic CV, turn it into a new section. Maybe you've done a lot of public engagement and that's not part of a normal CV. If that's a strength that you can sell, you make that into its own section and you sell it. 
So you control the format. So you want to emphasize whatever it is that makes you look good. Applying for the position. Now, the number one trick of getting a job is that you have to apply for a job. No one's ever going to offer you anything. And you're not going to feel ready. And you're probably not ready. You know, none of us were ready. I know that when I applied for faculty position, I didn't think I was ready and I wasn't ready. But the point is, you're applying for the chance to learn. And you'll learn once you're on the job. Apply anyway. Don't hold yourself back. Because if you're holding yourself back, then you're never going to succeed. There are going to be so many people out there that are going to try to hold you back. Don't you be one of them. The other thing is you're going to get rejected. And in a way, we're used to this in science. You know, we get rejected constantly by journals and by grants. And it feels a little bit more personal when you get rejected by jobs. Um, unfortunately, you're going to have to deal with it because rejections are normal. If you have the best application in the world, you might get a 50% success rate. But if you're just a normal good scientist applying for a realistic job, you'll probably have a success rate somewhere in the range of 10%. Uh, now, notably, this makes it hard if you're not mobile. If you can only apply for jobs locally and there's only one institute, a 10% roll of the dice uh, isn't great. Whereas if you have the ability to move and you can apply to places covering 30, 40 institutes, you've got a lot more ability to get that job. So I'd say mobility really increases your chances, but I would also only apply for places that you want to live for 10 to 15 years. A faculty position is not a lifetime commitment, but it is a job that you're going to get the most out of if you spend 10 to 15 years there, and you might want to spend the rest of your life there. So only apply to somewhere that you actually want to live. Lifestyle matters. You don't want to go to a place where you wouldn't raise a family if that's your thing. You don't want to, um, it, you know, if salary is important to you or quality of life, um, support for new parents, the availability of green spaces. Think about these things in advance and don't apply to a place that you don't want to live in. The other thing I say is that there are multiple types of faculty calls. Um, and the easiest calls to get are the most competitive. These are the open calls. And it's odd that an open call, and here I'm talking about an open call being, um, it's widely advertised in, in different scientific publications and, and people are actively trying to get as many applicants as they, as they can. So the standard goes up. Now in this system, I think it's very important for us to acknowledge that men have an unearned advantage. And I think that unearned part of, it, of that is really important to emphasize. It can be overcome. And certainly, um, I, I hope that women don't hold themselves back from applying, even though there is an unearned advantage. We are, some of us are working on trying to reduce that unearned advantage and we are moving in the right direction, not fast enough and we're not there yet, but it is happening. Now, in addition to open calls, you often have these closed calls or limited calls. And you'll see this um, in universities that might just have the position on the university website and they don't advertise widely. And it might be for a very short time. You know, maybe the ad is only up there for 10 days. And you think, oh, this is good. No one else has seen this application. There are going to be fewer people that apply for it. It'll be less competitive. And actually, those calls I find are usually rigged. And actually, there's been some good scientific studies showing that those calls are rigged against um, women and rigged against, rigged against international applicants. Usually, a closed call is for an internal pre-selected candidate that they can't just give the job to. They need to go through the sham of having a call. So they'll advertise to as few people as possible for the shortest amount of time possible. So even though they're not very competitive, they're also very hard to get. And then there are universities that have automatic ins. In Europe, for example, if you get an ERC start grant, it's very competitive. But if you get one of those grants, half the universities in Europe will just give you a position on the spot if you take that grant with you. Um, I'm not sure if there's a, a similar system in Canada. Now, in the application, um, I've mentioned CV and cover letter. You really got to highlight your strengths. Um, you got to have a paragraph that explains your interests as well as having dot points. I actually want to read some, some narrative that explains to me 
what is it your passion passion about in your CV so that when I see that in your research project, I can really see that your CV and your research project aligns. Here, my advice would be to harness your inner American and really sell yourself. And, you know, depending on what culture you're from, that can feel really weird. You know, I don't like doing that selling of myself because my cultural background, it's not something we do. But you really do need to do it because no one's going to sell you. You've got a very short amount of time for the reader of your application to either put you on the read again pile or put you in the bin. And you have to make your case for yourself because people are not making the case for you at that point. Your project has to be the most exciting thing you've got. And you really need to convince the jury that this is important work and should be funded. The other thing I'd say is you need to think about the logistics. How fast are you gonna grow your lab? What size do you wanna reach? Are you gonna be mostly students or postdocs? How are you gonna pay for those students? This is not always part of the application. Certainly it's very rarely part of the written application, but it tends to come up a lot in the interview stage. And if you get hit with these questions for the first time in an interview, you're gonna fub them and it's gonna look bad. So spend time thinking about these questions. And it really gives you two things. One, it, it gives you a degree of maturity. When I applied for positions, I was quite young at the time. I was um, uh, 28 when I got my faculty position. And so I really got hit with a lot of questions because you know I was too young to run a lab. And um, one of the things I had to prove was that I was actually mature enough and experienced enough to do it. The other thing it does is it shows, you, it shows the people in the jury that you've researched the position. If you don't know what grants are available locally and what's realistic to apply for locally, then that shows that you haven't really thought about this particular place. And I think it's really important that by looking at that local logistics, you're proving to them that you're someone who's taking the application really seriously and you've thought about how it would be to run a lab in that institute. Now, if we get on to the interview, I'd say one of the key things is that every interaction you have is part of the interview. You know, when you're dealing with the PA who books your flights, remember that that PA has more time with the director than you ever will. If you're giving your seminar, that's a sales pitch, you have lunch with PhD students. Those students are reporting on you. I've seen a application torpedoed because the students came out of lunch and said, ah, oh, that guy was a real misogynist jerk. And we didn't see it as faculty but the students saw it during the lunch and that application was torpedoed. So, you know, be nice to everyone. Um, if you're having a, co a coffee break chat, that's probably a faculty member who's trying to make an instant position, an instant opinion on you. Maybe they had one worry about your application and they're gonna come up and just casually work it into the conversation. It's not someone just having coffee chat. It really is part of the interview process, dinner and drinks, Someone sober there is taking notes on you. Um, and often you'll have like a breakfast chat the next morning. And for me, who is someone who is quite introverted, it's really exhausting because you're just performing 24 hours straight, constantly on and constantly trying to um, respond to people. But it is a really grueling thing to go through these interviews. I'd say in general, don't be a jerk to anyone. I and mean, that's good advice to follow for the rest of your life as well, not just the interviews. And listen to people, ask follow-up questions because faculty want colleagues that care about their research as well, about, as well as about your research. And try to read people, try to work out what someone is asking you about. Do they wanna know more about your science? Do they wanna know how you would solve a particular problem? Do they wanna see something about your creativity or your teaching experience? It's so easy to slip into pre-prepared answers or questions that you've heard before, and you have to make sure that you listen to what they're actually asking and answer the question they're actually asking. I would say absolute minimum, you wanna do three sets of two hour interview practices. Ideally twice that, and ideally practicing with multiple people because different people are going to ask you different questions. And even if it rattles you the, the first time, on the second time, 
when you start getting the same questions over and over again, you at least come up with some type of answer and you won't look like a stunned mullet when it comes up in an interview. Okay, so let's assume now that you've got the position. They've offered you a job, um, they want you to come and join and start up a lab. Here, I think it's important to negotiate your position. And I've got a few tips on how to make that deal. First of all, find out what is negotiable before you enter negotiations. For example, in some systems, salary is negotiable. You know, in, in a lot of the US, it's very negotiable, your salary. In other places, like in Belgium, there are fixed scales. You just cannot negotiate salary. It's based on how many years you are out from your PhD, and there are legal requirements to pay on those fixed scales. Sometimes things like holidays are fixed. Sometimes they're flexible. But you find out in advance what you can talk about, what you can negotiate, and you only negotiate those things that are actually negotiable. Now, I'd say I think it, it feels very weird to ask about salary, but you know this might be from my more Australian and European background, because, for example, Americans often feel quite a lot more comfortable talking about salary. And a lot of scientists feel really weird about asking salary. I've got to say, having offered paid jobs to 50-plus staff, I can't remember any of them asking me about salary. I've always accepted the job beforehand. Sometimes I said, wait a second, you don't even know what I'm offering you in salary, and they don't like asking for it. This is, this is a place where you have to ask. Your, your salary going into your tenure track position has an enormous impact on your salary for the rest of your career and on your pension and so forth. So ask and negotiate. In terms of startup package, um, this is the other part you need to negotiate. You got to work out what you need to do the science that you've proposed. If you've proposed science that's going to cost $5 million, then if you don't get $5 million, you're not going to deliver that. And that's going to be a problem. So either you have to go to somewhere that will offer you $5 million, or you have to rewrite your plans to make them more realistic. And here I'd say talk to your PI, or even better, talk to a lab manager. Lab managers know much more about budgets than PIs. They're experienced in how much things actually cost and get an accurate costing. Now, when you're negotiating, you want to know what that top line is, how much it's going to cost. But don't get fixated on it. If your proposal is going to cost $500,000, you don't need to have all $500,000 in cash. Maybe you need to have, because um, you're going to spend that cash on stuff anyway. And sometimes the director has got an issue that they cannot exceed 300,000. You need 500,000, that creates a problem. But if you can really negotiate on individual items, the director can sometimes make it work. They're only gonna give you 300,000, but they're gonna give you um, free mouse housing until your first grant, or you'll get 50 hours of free plus optometry time per year, something like that that basically drops your cost down to the point where you can do the project for 300,000. Because you are really asking for the resources to do the project and some of that can be in cash, some of that can be in in-kind in contribution. Another thing is to look at exemptions. Quite often people want you to teach. Um, be very aware that teaching takes time and it especially takes time the first time you do it. The first year you, you do teaching, you're going to spend a lot of time on it. And if you're doing that at the same time as trying to start up a lab, you're going to end up basically sabotaging yourself because the teaching is always urgent. So you end up doing the urgent things, which means you never do the important things. So I think it's quite reasonable to explain that you'll need several years to build up your lab. And you're happy to start teaching. You're happy to take on these courses, but you can want a teaching holiday for one year, two years, you look mature, you look savvy, um, you look like you've thought about these things and you're not just saying yes to everything. It's completely fine to negotiate these exemptions. Now, once you've negotiated them, get it in writing. It's absolutely critical to get this stuff in writing. Oral agreements are great, but you have to have it written down. And it doesn't need to be, um, you don't ha have to bother the director 100 times over. You can go via their PA to um, remind them of things that need to be included. Sometimes you're going to get two contracts, a work contract, which is really about your salary and conditions, and then a second agreement that covers things 
like a teaching holiday and your startup package, um, that's fine. Make sure you do get both of those documents. Sometimes they want to just give you the work contract and then all of the startup package is just in emails and um, but not in the contract. That's not okay. You absolutely have to have it in writing. And it's not just a sign of distrust. You know, memories fade. And for you, this negotiation is absolutely critical, but the director is doing this on a monthly basis. And directors retire, they get new jobs. The new director is not gonna feel bound to the agreements that some other director made five years ago and didn't bother to write down. So you absolutely have to get this in writing. And some of the directors might be a little bit offended by this. Sometimes they'll say things, you know, like, um, well, I've given you my word on this, isn't that enough? And you can't say, no, it's not enough. What you can do though is say, oh, you know, absolutely, you know, I, I trust you implicitly. This is why I want to join your department because I really trust you and want to work with you. But I do know one of my close friends, they had an experience where they joined the department of a great director but that director was then recruited off to a new high profile position and the new director came in and the new director didn't, didn't abide by any of the agreements. So this is not about my relationship with you. It's really about making sure that when you're recruited off to uh, run the next big institute that I have some protection in place. So you can say it in a nice way, but you have to get it in writing. Now, you've got the job, you've negotiated a good package and you're setting up a lab. Here's my advice on setting up a lab. Hires are the most critical things that you're going to do ever in a lab. You hire the right staff and the lab will, will run itself. You hire the wrong staff and it's going to be a nightmare. Um, lab managers are fantastic. Lab managers know more about running a lab than you ever will. They're the people who actually run the lab. You just get in money and and uh, give talks selling their results. They run the lab. So talk to a lab manager, get their advice. If possible, poach them. You know, if you can bring someone over who's already a lab manager, that's amazing. That's, that's what set us on a pathway to success when we started up, is that J James had been an experienced lab manager. I was coming in to write the grants and write the papers, and we each had our own domains, and it just works fantastic. If you can't hire a lab manager, hire an experienced technician. Experienced technicians cost more, but they're worth it. They really are worth it. Um, and if you find a technician that you trust, then treat them well, promote them, give them pay rises, give them responsibility. Make sure that they know you have a long-term commitment to them. Because the longer a technician stays in your lab, the more useful they are. They are the living repository of all knowledge where are those old plasmids? How do I book this? Um, they know everything because I've seen it all before. And so having even one person who stays at the lab long-term means that you're never really losing skills. If you always have a high turnover, you're constantly creating, training, and then losing skills. Something to know though on your, your startup, your, your initial staff, not all going to have the same motivation and skills that you have. You know, it's, it's funny, but as a small startup lab, I spent more on salary than I do now because at that point, I just had to hire people who wanted to come and work in a no-name. Now I've got a really great situation where people who are talented scientists come and wanted to work with me and then three months later get their own fellowship. Um, so I'm spending less on salaries than I did 12 years ago. And it's really tough to get exceptional staff when you're a no-name. Because even if you've had a really big paper, the people who see that paper and want to go and work in that lab, they're looking at working in your old lab, not in your lab. So until you get last author papers, you're a bit of a no one and it's really hard to, to recruit really exceptional people. Um, most of the staff that are going to be applying for these jobs, they, they want more of a life than you. They want to work fewer hours and that's normal. Don't, don't push people beyond their limits. For one thing, it's not nice. Um, you're in the privileged position of being a boss, so be a nice boss. And for a second thing, it doesn't really work. If you rely on pushing people in order to make things happen, you have to constantly be there pushing 
and they leave and they're not happy and it and doesn't work in the end. It breaks down quickly. If you're someone who can bring in good people who, have, who are self-driven and you can provide them with the environment so that they want to succeed and they want to stay, that's much more, um, it's much nicer and it's much more effective. Uh, so you're going, to have, you're going to bring people in, have realistic expectations and then lower them. Things that were working in your old lab when you're a postdoc, for some strange reason, they're not going to work in your new lab. Everything takes more time. It's slower. It's how things are. Bring up problems early. Um, and if they're, if, if they're not fixed, then you've got to fire people. I've seen a lot of older PIs that are really not invested in their stuff enough. But I've also seen a lot of young PIs, especially, who are way over invested in their staff and there'll be someone in the lab who is very problematic and they spend years and years trying to help that person who essentially is just going to be a problem forever and when you've only got one or two positions that can basically stunt the growth of the lab at the most critical point uh, certainly don't pass probation on staff that are problematic because things only get worse now that said you're also going to have some fantastic staff and when you find those people who are great, you have to be loyal to them. Um, never do something like punish staff for making a mistake or a misjudgment. They should feel free to make mistakes. They should feel the, um, supported and secure. Okay, the culture of the lab is also absolutely critical. Here, my number one piece of advice is to create lab policies. And this is because people come in with different expectations. Everyone's been to different labs and maybe they ran something this way in your PhD and you expect other labs all around the world to act exactly the same way. They don't. Every lab's different. Every lab's got different expectations. The least you can do is let them know your expectations on day one. Be upfront about that and let them know what you expect. And um, I often make this clear to people during the hiring process. So if they don't like it, they, they don't join the lab. Now make your expectations though, reasonable and compassionate. Don't be a bastard. I mean, we, we've got too many people like that in science. You should be one of the good guys, be a good boss. And um, if you want to make your own lab policies, take a, a screenshot of the screen now. There's three examples here that you can look up that are open source lab policies. Pull from them the best parts and develop them yourself. Now, I would say flat structures are basically the starting point of every new lab. Everyone comes in as having been a postdoc surrounded by other postdocs. You like that feeling of being one of the team and it's a great starting point, but it's also overrated and it's going to cause problems in the end because ultimately you can be a friend or you can be a boss, but you can't be both. And it might not be a problem for a couple of years, but at some point it can become a problem. Now, when I say you have to be a boss, I don't mean you have to be a, bad, a nasty boss. You can be a really nice boss. You can be the boss who cares and understands, but you have a different set of responsibilities to the people in the lab. And when you say something, it's got a different influence on people in the lab. When you're just one of the postdocs and you tease each other, it feels great. When you're the boss, it might feel the same to you, but to your team, they might feel very, very differently because they're seeing you as the boss and you can't interact in the same way. Um, you're going to have to give critical feedback. You're going to have to pull people up and say, you know, look, you're not meeting my expectations. This is what I want. Those conversations are tough, but they're important. Now, my tip here is to always give positive feedback together with critical feedback. We often as scientists always think on the problems. If you go straight into the problems, people get very defensive. Start by telling people what they're doing right. Focus on that and then move on to things where you want them to improve. The other thing that I think really helps is if you talk about your feelings with I language rather than you language. For me, one of the things that really gets my goat is people missing deadlines. 
and I can bring someone to the office and say, said, you missed this deadline, um, that's a problem. And they're gonna immediately be defensive and um, they're gonna come up with excuses and so forth. And it's not very productive. Instead, you can phrase that in I language. You can pull them into the office and you can say, look, deadlines are really important to me because a deadline, missing a deadline for me feels like a sign of disrespect. It feels like you don't care enough about um, me to respect me enough to meet the deadline or to, to let me know in advance that it wasn't going to be met. And straight away, you're changing, you're, you're, you're actually being more accurate when you're talking to them. And it changes the di dynamic. They're much more likely to understand that this is important to you. And they're much more likely to change their behavior. Um, I'd say you need to delegate responsibility. Lab managers are great to delegate responsibility. But once you do, you got to stand by their, their decisions. You can't delegate responsibility to a lab manager and then um, override them publicly because it's going to crush them. It's not good for them. It's not good for the lab. If you disagree and you will, discuss that privately and let them fix the issue. Uh, have time for your people. Have loyalty to them and learn where to set your limits. Your commitment to them should be proportional of theirs to the lab. And if you overinvest in one underperforming staff member, that comes at a time cost that is felt by the rest of your team. So you have to learn where to draw the line in overcommitting and in undercommitting. You have to commit appropriately to bring people up to their, um, to give their people the opportunity to rise to their potential. Just the last few slides now. Um, the first expenses, basically going to be equipment, talk to a lab manager, get their advice. Again, lab managers know more about this than you ever will. You should be looking at getting a 30% discount on all equipment as a startup lab. If they're not going to give you that, walk away. Tell the sales rep that you'll walk away if you don't get 30% discount. Um, even better is to get the technician or lab manager to say that, you know, oh, that lab is going to be growing growing fast, we're going to be making all of these follow-up purchases, we're putting in huge grants. And basically those sales reps will give you big, big discounts because they want to lock you into particular platforms. Because if you get a Eppendorf centrifuge and you love it, well, your next centrifuge will also be an Eppendorf. So by selling you one cheap Eppendorf at the start, they can lock you in for 20 years of, of Eppendorf purchases. In terms of consumables, get quotes. Um, 10 to 40% discounts are very common and add up. And sometimes your local rep won't negotiate. In that case, you can bypass them and go straight to um, headquarters. You know, I know in, in Belgium, sometimes the Belgian rep wouldn't give us a discount. So we wrote to the US rep and got the discount, 30, 40% discount, cheaper even with the extra shipping costs. Uh, remember, time is money. Sometimes people fall in the trap of doing everything themselves. They'll make up all of their own tack. They'll make up um, every reagent that you can make up because it's possible. And it seems so much cheaper. But the thing is, you have got so few staff. And if you have them sp spending all of their time making up solutions and, and make, growing their own tack and, and using doing things on the cheap, you're going to end up having no time for real experiments. So spend the money on kits, outsource, use facilities when you can, um, and save their time for the really interesting science. The aim is not to hoard your startup package. The aim is to spend it wisely to get output. So we don't want to hoard it. We want to spend it and we want scientific output to come out of it. It's also staff like doing interesting experiments. They don't like racking tip boxes and, and growing up tack. Um, now, the output. Here, I think it's really important to focus on portable output. Your institute does not have loyalty to you. Your institute is a research hotel that you are renting by the year. And you're renting that hotel with your overheads, they, and they're providing you a place where you can succeed. They're prov hopefully providing you um, a good environment, but you have to prove that you're a good investment for them by constantly producing output. Here, it's really important that your portable output are grants and papers. If you have to leave the Institute, 
if you have a good set of grants and papers, you can move to a new place. If you've spent all of your time on committees and teaching and so forth, no one outside your institute can see that. It doesn't help you get a new position. And even inside your institute, there's a very short memory for good citizenship. It's much better to have a record of getting in good papers and grants than having a record of sitting on all the committees because ultimately those good papers and grants secure your position, they secure your promotion. Good citizenship doesn't help you very much, unfortunately, which means you have to learn to say no. And some people struggle saying no, so learn your strategy. Maybe don't say no, maybe say next year. Um, and then next year, say next year again. Maybe say, let me check up and get back to you and then don't check up. Or say, I'd love to, but I can't because there's a calendar clash because I've already taken on something else. Ultimately, you do need to take on some institutional responsibilities, but then take on the ones that help you. You know, if you do a lot of flow cytometry, sitting on the committee for, for flow cytometry will actually help your lab. Whereas if you're sitting on a committee that's got nothing to do with you, you're going to find it boring and it's not going to help you. And the other thing is that when you do get your tenure, pay it forward to all of the tenure track people by taking on these crummy jobs so that they don't have to. So when you're tenure track, avoid the stuff like the plague, but in return, when you get your tenure, take it on so that it doesn't burden the tenure track people. And remember, this is a, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You're looking at success for 10 years. You might be able to drive yourself into the ground for one or two years. You probably did as a PhD student or as a postdoc, but you can't do that forever and you shouldn't do that forever. You need to pace yourself to have a sustained effort that you can live like that for 10 years. And accept that you're going to drop some stuff. There's, there's so much stuff to do with a PI that you're going to drop the ball. So make sure that you drop the balls that don't matter. Prioritize the things that are important. Prioritize your people, your grants, and your papers, and look after yourself. And if you miss the occasional committee meeting or you do a crummy job at this, that, or the other, so be it. it something has to drop sometimes. Uh, I think this is the second to last slide now. Um, your science, cultivate an eye for what's interesting. One of the things that people often do is start projects that are very incremental because we've got a, we're, we're always seeing opportunities for experiments that we could do that could solve something. But some questions, not, not all questions are, are created equally. Some questions are intrinsically interesting. Some questions are not interesting to many people. So don't start a project unless the best case scenario would make a big splash. Write down the title if everything worked well and imagine what journal would, would want to publish that title. And if it's an incremental finding in the best case scenario, then just don't start it up and learn to cut your losses. So many times I'll see a good research idea. It starts up, the first six through experiments show that it's not going to work. You go think, oh, well, you know, I've already done this much work. I'll just do a few more experiments and get a negative results paper. Um, the problem is that it takes so much longer to publish than you expect you end up doing not just three months more experiments, but six months more experiments. And then it's a year in the revision process. And suddenly you realize that you've spent two years following up something that you really knew after three months wasn't gonna go anywhere. And the biggest regrets that junior faculty often have is throwing too much time and money into dead projects because it's an opportunity cost. You can always do something more interesting with that time and money. In terms of collaboration, collaborate with good collaborators. One of the problems that happen is that there are some leeches out there in the university that see a junior faculty who's got an exciting new technique and they want that to be performed on their side, uh, on their projects, and they're never going to give you anything back in return. And it's very easy for a junior faculty to get pulled into doing 20 different collaborations. They only take up 5% of your time, but if you do 20 of them, that's 100% of your time. And those middle authorships will not help you get tenure. They will not help you get a grant. They've just sucked up all of your time and all of your space, and then you've got nothing to show for it at the end. So my rule of thumb is that help out labs where you would like to see them helping you out later. You've got a great technique they want. They've got a great technique you want. That can be a very good relationship. 
And then when you find people that are good to collaborate with, that can be invested in long-term. So fewer collaborations, but collaborations that are strong and mutually beneficial, that's the way to do it. Grant writing, you should always be writing grants, always be submitting. Don't invest too much into any individual grants. If you're writing two or three grants a year, then you don't get torn up when half of them get rejected. And you know most will. Follow the opportunities, write the grant they want to fund. Don't spend too much time on each grant. Um, you know, if you're spending a month writing a grant, that's probably a good amount of time. If you're spending a year writing a grant, that's not a great investment, especially because high rejection rates are the norm. And don't worry, you'll get better over time. So that's pretty much it. Uh, good luck. You're going to make mistakes. Um, I made mistakes. We all make mistakes as a new PI. Your staff are going to be make mistakes, but be kind to them. Be kind to yourself. Uh, learn from your mistakes and then pass that wisdom forward as I've tried to do today. Thank you.